I thought it was Kendall. Well, it's no, Kendall's the only one that died. Okay. okay. And then the six wins. Seven, um, wait, eight. So, reminder. Mentioned this at the end of the class yesterday. Uh, page 68, there's 18 questions that you can answer um, by reading pages 64, 65, 66, 67 on page 68. Okay. Um, I'll set that up. What's today? Tuesday. Tuesday? 26th. How about next Tuesday? Next was Tuesday at midnight. November 2nd, November 2nd. Okay, so you guys can do that, write it out, or do type it, or however you want to do it. Um, what? Next a week from today. At midnight. At midnight. So you'll be back from your four-day break, and then you can do it that night if you want, or you can do it between now and then. Okay, uh, it's, it's 18 points, it's optional. Uh, I know some of you want some points and may need some points, so there you have it, okay? Okay, uh, so next thing we're looking at as we're studying political parties, the organization of political parties, okay? And like we do with federalism, we're going to look at the national parties, the state parties, and the local parties. Yeah? Yes, right. sir. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so... To start with, we'll talk about the national parties, okay? And so the national parties, we have the Republican National Committee, okay? So National Committee. And the Democratic National Committee, okay? Otherwise known as the RNC and the DNC, okay? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of times the Republican Party is referred to as the GOP, uh, which you'll read about in that homework assignment, uh, which stands for Grand, yeah, Grand Old Party, even though the Democratic Party is older. Uh, the Democratic Party dates back to uh, 1846, I believe, uh, and the Republican Party, uh, 1860, right around there, with Lincoln. Okay. Um, now, these committees run the, the national party, okay? The RNC has 100 members. Two from each state. state, one male and one female, okay? From each state, makes up the RNC, okay? The Democratic Party, has 133 members. The first 100 come from each state, one male and one female, and then 33 at-large members for the larger states. They have more set, which makes them more democratic. Yes? Yes. Okay. Now, they have two major roles. How many? Two. Two major roles of the National Party. Okay. And that is to run the conventions, the national conventions. Okay. And you got to see that in the video a little bit. These big, you know, Rallies where they have thousands of people cheering with signs and red, white, and blue, yes? Now, when are those usually up? Uh, every four years. Oh, yep. Usually in August of presidential election year. So every four years. August of 2020. Okay. And they'll, each, each party will pick a city, and that city will host the convention, okay? The other major role of the RNC and DNC is to 
raise money. So when the Republican or Democratic Party raises money, they can use that money to help get Republicans and Democrats elected. Yes? I mentioned the gubernatorial election uh, in Virginia. That is actually a week from today, November 2nd. Okay. There's also uh, city counts, or uh, excuse me, uh, school board elections going on in Wichita, Bel Air, next Tuesday. Okay. And if you haven't been paying attention, school boards have been the topic of much talk recently, yes? Yes. Uh, even at the national level. Um, so, I'm going to educate myself. Are any of you guys registered? Okay, that's probably too late for this election. Usually they stop uh, about 20 days out. Um, all right. <laughs> Thank you. At least it's not a sub thing. Yeah, I was ready for it. Did I hear about the ACT guy? Who, what? The ACT guy. ACT? Oh, he is. He's running for school board. Would you vote for him? No. <laughs> well, do you know what his platform is? What no. Is? Okay. That's what I'm thinking. So, I think he's good. These are kind of hard to find information on, um, like these types of local elections. Um, so, you might have to do a little digging. I'll, I'll do a little digging, but we. I live in a different school district. And, well, I don't know. You have to Wichita. I live in 259. I, I don't know how many of you guys live in, you know, some of you guys might live in Mays or. Yeah. So you got to kind of research those candidates for those those different districts. Right. <coughs> no. Um, the state board of education does um, to an extent. So, like, we have state assessments that you guys all have to do, um, and I've been dealing with that uh, in the history department, in the social studies department. Um, they actually, they move those in-house, so they're classroom-based social studies assessment. These assessments, guys, are mandated by the Kansas State Constitution. Uh, the con our state constitution mandates that we give assessments. Uh, now, those are generally directed down from the national U.S. Department of Education um, that really started a lot of that with uh, No Child Left Behind back in 2000. Uh, so that all, ever since you guys have been in school, uh, you guys have been assessed and assessed and assessed, okay? Um, which really uh, flies in the face of good educational philosophy. Uh, as, you know, I'm taking, you know, getting my master's in teaching and learning right now. And, uh, you know, most most of the, <coughs> the pedagogy that goes into, you know, the best methods of teaching uh, do not surround themselves with assessment tests at a state level or a national level. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, be that as it may. Now, each one of these two parties has a chairperson. Okay. And I wouldn't have went ahead and wrote the names of these two chair people on the board for you. Okay. Uh, for the Republicans, Ronna Romney McDaniel. Uh, yes, this is the daughter of Mitt Romney. Okay, uh, so she has the hyphenated last name. And uh, Jamie Harrison, um, who is an African American gentleman. Okay, um, these are the chairs. Okay, so they run the two parties. They're in charge. They have co-chairs and so forth. Uh, these folks are elected for four-year terms, and I think, actually, Ronna McDaniel uh, is on her second term, which is not real common for them to serve more than one term, uh, but she's on her second. Um, and I, I mean, like, you can follow these people on Twitter, you know what I mean? They have Twitter accounts, you can follow the chairs, um, or even the organizations. Um, you can follow them. Now, they have two main jobs. These people have two main jobs. One, when both 
both presidential elections and congressional elections or control of Congress. Okay. Now, Harrison is new to the Democrats. Okay. Uh, and as I said, Rana, uh, she's been around. Okay. Their job is to win. Okay. To take control of Congress or maintain control of Congress. Okay. Uh, and the other ma major role is to raise money and create unity within the party. That's bad. Unity. Okay. Now, today, we would say, okay, who is the head of the Republican Party? Ronald Romney McDaniel. Who would we say today is the leader of the Democratic Party? Joe Biden. Okay, so they lose power to the kind of the, to the president. Here. You know what I mean? So you look at the leader of the party. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Now uh, this could be a tricky job being the chair of these national committees because, as you guys, as we've kind of talked about. You have different wings of the Democratic Party. You have the more progressive, socialist wing of the Democratic Party, and then you have more of the moderate wing. And then in the Republican Party, you have similar issues uh, with the moderates and the conservatives, yes? Um, so trying to create party unity is important. Um, let me go back to 2016, because everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Uh, when Donald Trump decided to run for president in 2016, the party elites, like these people that were members of the National Committee and so forth, do you think they wanted Donald Trump to win the nomination for the Republican Party in 2016? No, they did not. They really did not. Um, they wanted somebody like Jeb Bush. Okay, Jeb Bush was former governor of Florida, right? His brother was president for eight years. His dad was president for four years. Yes, they wanted Jeb Bush. They wanted somebody along those lines. But the voters got to choose. The Republican Party voters got to choose. Okay, and this was a difficult job uh, for her predecessor. Was a guy named Reince Priebus was the RNC chair, and I felt he did a really good job of trying to unite the Republican Party once Trump got the nomination. Okay, because you you, you need that unity uh, to try and take control of Congress. Okay, and you see the importance of control of Congress uh, and what legislation gets through. Okay, so um, these are important jobs, even though we may they're not household names. Uh, these are important jobs, and these these parties do play an important role in our process. Uh, and just giving you a basic understanding here. Okay, so when when we look at the state parties, so take Kansas for instance, uh, Kansas has a state Republican Party and a state Democratic Party, okay? Every state does. And really, the states, state parties, okay, so you would say Kansas, Republican, Republican Party, and the Kansas Democratic Party. And they really mirror the national level. So uh, representing Republicans or Democrats at the state level, okay, they will have membership based on counties. So we have 105 counties. Okay, so you will send uh, a county rep for each one. Okay. And they don't uh, necessarily do the one male, one female thing at the state level. Okay. But the chair, there's a state chair uh, for for both parties. Okay. And so don't don't really concern yourself too much with that. Okay. Um, it's not going to be on the test. Okay. But at the local level, you guys ever heard this term? Yeah. 
So at the local level, that's your grassroots level, all right? And if you want to change the direction of the country, like really change the direction, you have to start at the, at the grassroots level and work up rather than the national level working down, okay? The, the grassroots level is really how you build majorities in state legislatures, okay? That transposes into majorities at the U.S. Congress, okay, and the presidential victories, all right? So you break down the local parties, uh, generally by counties, okay, Okay, so each county will have, uh, you know, Republican and Democratic Party. And I told you guys what Cedric County here that we live in, uh, what they call the Republican Party in Cedric County. The, the elephant, the Pachydermy Club, right? And then you have the Cedric County Democratic Party, okay? The Pachydermy Club and the Cedric County Democratic Club, okay? Now, when you look at cities like Wichita, or bigger cities like uh, Chicago or New York, okay, they are divided up into wards. Okay, a ward. A ward is a unit that cities are divided. So, You've all heard of the city council. Okay. okay. Uh, so each city council member in the Wichita City Council represents a ward. Okay, so it's basically just a district. Okay. Um, and then inside those wards, you get what are called precincts. Spell that right. Yeah, I spelled that right. Okay. This is the smallest unit in politics. A precinct. So when you go vote, you vote in your precinct. Okay. Does anybody know where mom and dad go vote? Okay, we go we go to the Lutheran Church by our house. So like, I can walk to my voting poll. Okay, it's right across the street. Okay, um, so usually it's going to be a school or a church or something like that near where you live. Okay, it's really it's a small number of city blocks. Is a precinct, okay? Now, so that's where you will go vote, right? And you have precinct captains for all these different precincts, <coughs> right? Within the parties. Multiple precincts make up a ward, yes? And usually several square blocks, okay? <coughs> Now, there were a couple major movements, grassroots movements, that we've seen in recent history, okay? They mentioned this in the video. There was a group called the Christian Coalition. In the videos I showed you, they talked about Jimmy Carter and how evangelicals, like myself, Flock to Jimmy Carter. Now I didn't. I wasn't voting back then, and my parents hated Jimmy Carter. And I really wasn't an evangelical in 1976. I was too young to understand any of that. But anyhow, they flocked to Jimmy Carter because he was a strong Christian man, okay. But as times began to change in this country, and you saw Roe v. Wade in 1973, right? Okay. And you saw a push for homosexual rights in this country, okay? What happened was the Democratic Party took in those causes, 
and the Democratic Party changed its platform. In the South, the Democratic Party left the voters. The voters didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party changed. Voters still remained generally very religious in the South, in the Bible Belt, and so forth. Okay. So what happened in the 1980s, the Christian coalition went about trying to get Christians elected to local school boards, the city council the state legislatures, and those people ran under the Republican Party banner. And by 1992, 94, the Republican Party had taken back control of Congress for the first time in 40 years, in 1994. That started in the 80s at the grassroots level. Okay? Now, President Obama did something very similar. Does anybody know what Obama did before he was president? Yeah. When he ran for president, he raised a billion dollars. Before he ran for president, he was a U.S. senator from Illinois. Yeah, but he lived in Chicago. Now, before he ran for the U.S. Senate, because he didn't even finish one full term, in the Senate, six years before he became president. He didn't even finish the term. He was senator for four years and then was elected president. Follow me? Before that, he served in the state legislature in Springfield, which is the capital of Illinois. Yes? Chicago's not the capital. Now, before that, he was what was called a community organizer. Pay attention, community organizer. All right. So in the early 2000s, progressives like Barack Obama started raising awareness, and especially in our big cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Ohio, places like this. And they did community organizing, which got people registered to vote. Talk to them about issues that affected them in the cities. Okay. This is how Obama got elected president. Okay. Through this community organizing and trying to get progressives to run for office and organizing people to get out to vote. Okay. That started at the grassroots level. They had organizations like uh, that were called ACORN. And you can find chapters of ACORN in every big city in the United States, okay? Now, this is getting pretty deep into the grassroots here, guys, okay? And stuff that you may not care about or understand or give a rat's and you know what. But I'm telling you, this is how you change the country. You start at the local level, okay? And that progresses up the chain, okay, to the federal level, all right? There's an old saying in politics. That all politics is local. Right. So, if you want to win, that's where you got to start. Right. If you want to change the country, that's where you got to start. Okay, next thing we're going to look at. The reasons why these parties have decreased in power over the years. Okay, the reason why the powers, uh, the power of the parties has decreased, okay, and I have four reasons why the parties have decreased in power. They're still relevant, still important, they still play a role, but their their power has waned. Number one. The rise of moderates. You know who you are. The rise of moderates 
people that don't want to identify themselves with one of these two parties. And can you blame them? So when you go to vote, you got your Republican candidates, you got your Democratic candidates. Okay. President, Vice President, House C, Senate C, State Legislature. Okay, you got the State House, State Senate, so forth. Okay. If you do this, you're a party line voter. Go in and vote all Republican or all Democrat. Okay? You do this, <coughs> you're called a split ticket voter. Okay? Now, Obviously, your belief, your worldview is going to align more with one party over another, generally, okay? But there are times, and even in my history of voting, where I have done some of this, been a split ticket vote. Can I give you an example? Yes. Okay. Uh, a few years ago, this is about 10 years ago, there was uh, a race for the district attorney. Uh, Wichita, okay? The DA is the one that uh, makes charges against criminals and sees prosecution of those criminals, okay? The DA at the time was a, a woman named Nola Folston, okay? And she successfully prosecuted two major cases during her tenure. One, BTK, and the other, the car brother. Okay, successful prosecution. She was a Democrat. Okay, the Republican that was running against her, forget the guy's name, don't want to throw him under the bus, but I actually knew somebody that knew this person that was running against her. It was actually Ali O'Connor. She goes, I know this guy. He's an ass. He's mean to his wife. He sucks. Don't vote for him. And I'm like, well, Nola Folston has really earned my vote. I mean, she's done a good job. I'm going to vote for her. Screw this Republican thug dude, okay? You know what I mean? So uh, you kind of, you, you look at these races and, and you, I mean, you want to become knowledgeable about the candidate, okay? And you certainly saw this with the current governor that we have in a red state, a Democratic governor, where people looked at the two candidates and said, I can't vote for this guy. I'm going to vote for her, okay? So, split ticket vote. Okay, that moderates kind of lead that, all right? So that's like people are always looking for the, the, those moderates. You know how the, the, the conservatives are going to vote. You know how the liberals are going to vote, right? You're trying to win the, the independents, moderates, yes? Okay. Number two reason why parties have decreased in power. Direct primaries. Okay. We talked about this before. Okay. 2022. Okay. We've got congressional elections coming up. Okay. You may have, you know, four, let's talk about the fourth district. Okay, U.S. House of Representatives, right? Who currently holds this seat? Ron Estes, right? Okay, so the election will be in November, yes? The first Tuesday after the first Monday in November on an even-numbered year, okay? You will have a primary election in what, August, September, okay? Okay, so let's say there are five candidates, five Republicans, and two Democrats, 
okay, candidates. So you'll be able to go vote to choose which candidate runs against the Republican or the Democrat. You follow me? Okay, now in Kansas, we are a closed primary state, which means if you are a Republican, you can vote in the Republican primary. You can't vote in the Democratic primary. If you're an independent, registered independent, you can't vote in either. Some states have open primaries, where if you're a Republican, you can vote in the Democratic primary. And if you're a Democrat, you can vote, you can vote in both of them. Which means you can try and sabotage the other party by trying to select the person that's easiest to defeat. I don't really understand open primary states other than allowing independents to vote in them. You know what I mean? But allowing you to cross over and vote the other party's primary. I don't, I don't understand that. But many states have open primaries. Kansas is closed. So if you want to have a say in which person is going to run for the 4th District for the Republican Party, you have to be a Republican. Follow me? Okay. But the parties don't get to choose. The people, the voters get to choose. It used to be the parties got to choose. You follow me? The last time when we talked about a presidential election, the last time was 1976 in Kansas City at the Republican National Convention. They showed this in the video. Gerald Ford had replaced Nixon. He was seen as a weak candidate. Who challenged him? Reagan did. Okay? And the Republican Party delegates, not the voters, chose Ford over Reagan. That was the last time they decided who the candidate was going to be at a convention. 76. Okay? Since then, since then, it's all done through this primary process. Okay, which two states are the first two states to hold the primary? Iowa and we haven't talked about this. Wyoming. New Hampshire. Listen, those are two small states. I mean, the majority of the population in Iowa lives in like three cities. You know what I mean? So if you are a relatively unknown candidate, say Bill Clinton, governor of Arkansas, who nobody heard of. I mean, I can't. I think I know who the governor of Arkansas is right now. His name's Hutchison, but um, nobody knows who the governor of Arkansas is. So Bill Clinton's going to run for president. So if you have these two small states, New Hampshire and Iowa. Okay, let me go through this with you. Okay, so let's go to 2024. The next presidential election will be held in November. Okay. Now, in order to get there, you got to do this. You start in January and February in Iowa and New Hampshire. Okay. Now, do you need a ton of money to go spend a couple months in Iowa or New Hampshire? to go out and campaign and meet people there. No. no. Now, if California was the first primary state, would you need a lot of money to do that? Yeah. So you can take a relatively unknown, not super wealthy individual that has charisma, go to these states, work their tail off, go knock on doors, go to diners, go to restaurants, meet people, shake hands, kiss babies, and tell them what you want to do as, you, as president. Okay? And you don't have to have a ton of money to do that. That's a great way, thing about our system right here. So after Iowa, New Hampshire, let's say you don't even win Iowa, New Hampshire, but nobody's ever heard of you. Say your name is Pete, Pete Buttigieg, okay, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and you finish third at the New Hampshire primary. Well, that's news. So who are people going to be talking about? Pete Buttigieg. Right? And so his name gets out there. And so when they leave Iowa and New Hampshire, 
They go to South Carolina. Then they go to Michigan. Okay? Now, guys, Joe Biden got his ass. He got whooped in New Hampshire and Iowa. Guys, he didn't finish in the top four. Biden did. South Carolina saved his presidency. Okay? Because it's a large African-American voting bloc in South Carolina. Okay, it's got a lot of African Americans, and most of those African Americans are registered with which party? Democratic Party. And so people in South Carolina said, get behind Joe Biden. Get behind Joe Biden. Okay, he won South Carolina. And that changed everything because he was not looking good. Okay. So you go to Michigan, and then, you know, you get to, like, uh, June. That's when we have Kansas. Okay? California is actually one of the last ones. So if you go back to 2012, or no, 2008, between Obama and Hillary, they were both running for the Democratic ticket. Okay? It went all the way to California before we knew it was going to be Obama instead of Hillary. Okay, so this primary process works its way out. Now, a lot of times we already know by June. Like in 2012, the Republicans knew it was going to be John McCain. Or 2008, we knew it was going to be McCain. So there was no reason for them to even show up here in Kansas and campaign. You know what I mean? We're not really relevant. In 2016, when you had Trump and Cruz and Rubio was still in it, all three of those came to Wichita. All three of those guys. Okay? And two of them showed up at the caucus, which is the primary. Okay? Now, and then in August, right, you have the convention. Okay? Then from there, they officially nominate at the convention who the, who the nominee is. They tell who the vice president's going to be. Now, they used to wait till the convention in August to announce the vice president running mate. Uh, Al Gore screwed that up in 2000. He announced it before the convention. Okay. And he chose a guy named Joe Lieberman, who I like. He's, he's Jewish, um, which would have been our first Jewish president or vice president. Okay. Um, Joe Lieberman. And uh, he's a common sense guy. Really like that guy. But anyhow, uh, so now they announced their running mates early, earlier, okay, before the convention. So these conventions don't mean anything anymore. It's just a bunch of speeches. Guys, when I was growing up, four days of these conventions, four freaking nights. And it was all televised from start to finish on all the networks. So, like, your favorite TV shows, you couldn't watch them because that's all you had was the, the convention, okay? Because they used to matter. Now they don't matter. They don't even show them on NBC, CBS, and ABC. And then the cable network started airing them the whole time, you know, CNN and all those. But now they don't even do it. So you got to go to uh, you got to go to PBS to watch the conventions or C-SPAN. Yes. yes. All right. So August after that, you have debates, right? They have presidential debates, and then the election. Okay. So the parties don't really have a say as much in the candidates, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes. Because of the primary. The other reason why, two other reasons, is that um, the TV and the internet, television, and the internet. Remember, one of the roles of political parties is to share and inform. Yeah. And we don't need them for that anymore. I don't get my information from the Republican National Committee. Do you? No. I get it from Twitter. And the last reason why parties have decreased in power are these. Political Action Committee, PACs. You guys heard of these? Yeah. 
We get out. We got like two minutes. Okay. Political action committees are five hundred one c threes. Something like that. It's a nonprofit. Talk about this. Like we could start our own pack. Yes. We started, and we would all be on the board, and we'd all pay ourselves a salary. Yes. We got to go out and raise some money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. And we're going to educate voters on issues. Yes. And we're going to raise millions, tens of millions. Yes. Guys, yeah, to educate voters. Yeah. We're all going to get paid six figures. <laughs> Let's go. I, I will uh, get into that a little deeper uh, tomorrow. Peace.